dedicated to strengthening democratic processes and, and, boost, and um, uh, boosting resilience to foreign authoritarian ins influence around the world. Uh, so with that, my name is Jack Herndon. I'm a program officer based in our Warsaw office in, uh, in Poland. And today our panel will focus on uh, different and competing major infrastructure visions for the region, uh, from China's Belt Road Initiative through the Three Seas Initiative, and explore the implications for democratic governance and political institutions. So with that, I'd like to introduce some of our panelists. Uh, with us today, we have Matthew Boyce, who is a career member of the Foreign Service and is, a, and is currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs, where he previously served as the Acting Deputy Chief of, Chief of Mission. Mr. Boyce has also served as the Minister Counsel for uh, Political Affairs in Ottawa, Canada, as a political advisor in Europe, and as Deputy Director for the Office of, of European Union and Business Affairs. He's completed numerous overseas tours in Europe and Asia, and Mr. Boyce has a BA from Haverford College and an MA in, the, in Soviet and Eastern European Affairs from Columbia University. We're also joined by Radosław Fogiel, who is a Polish politician and member of the Law and Justice Party, currently uh, the deputy of the same, of which has, he has been a member since 2019. Uh, and also a councillor of the Mazovian Sejmik. Mr. Fogel is the deputy chairman of the European Young Conservatives, which is a youth organization affiliated with the Alliance of, of European Conservatives and Reformists. Active since 2001, running for various elections and holding office in the Mazovian Sejmik, uh, and including the city, city uh, council of Radom. He has also served in the parliamentary office of Jaroslav Kaczynski, the president of the, of, uh, the Law and Justice Party. We are also joined by Mia Nuens of IISS, uh, in London, or should I say the International Institute for Strategic and Security, sorry, for Strategic Studies in London. Um, her expertise lies in China's cross-service defense analysis, uh, defense industry, China's defense industry, and Chinese regional and international strategic affairs. Uh, she, is, she has worked previously for the European External Action Service as a policy officer, uh, and she also has experience working for consulting firms and international organizations. Uh, we are also joined by Marika Olberg, of GMFUS's office in Berlin. Uh, she is a senior fe fellow of the Asia program uh, who co-leads the Stockholm China Forum. Um, uh, she was also, uh, she focuses on China's media and digital policies as well as the Chinese Communist Party's influence campaigns in Europe. And last we're joined with IRI's very own Matthew Schrader, sorry Matt, um, who is uh, China's, uh, who is IRI's advisor for the Center on Countering Foreign Authoritarian Influence uh, at IRI in Washington, D.C. Previously, Matt was at um, the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the, at the GMF US and the editor of the Jamestown China Brief. Uh, so with that, I was hoping actually to go first to Mr. Mr. Fogel. Uh, Mr. Fogel, I was hoping you can kick us off by explaining to us some, first the strategic importance of the Three Cs initiative. Uh, this is something that was started by Poland and Croatia back in 2015, which has since gained strong backing and financial support from the United States. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what needs it's meant to serve in the region and how has it been successful in developing a common consensus among countries in the region for, devel for developing common infrastructure and, and enhancing connectivity. Thank you very much. Mm, uh, sure, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to, to do that. The Free Seas uh, Initiative uh, is a, a project that uh, brings together 12 countries from the Baltic Sea, uh, to the Adriatic and to the Black Sea. These are the uh, countries that are members of European Union uh, for, for uh, many logistical and technical re uh, reasons. This is the way uh, it was decided to be, to be done. Although uh, we, well, the, the initiative is, is eager to work with uh, countries uh, from outside of the European Union as, um, as well. It was started by the Polish president um, Andrzej Duda and his uh, Croatian counterpart at the time. Uh, and uh, it's been six years and I may say this project is uh, quite successful already. This is a political but also infrastructural uh, project. It is uh, completed with, by the Free Seas uh, Initiative Investment Fund, which is a commercial investment fund dedicated to uh, financing, uh, uh, financing uh, inter uh, cross-border uh, cross uh, infrastructure projects in, uh, in uh, the initiative member, uh, member states. I think there are two 
most important dimensions of the of the free seas initiative uh, the first one is is the obvious one which is uh, creating and and developing uh, interconnectivity uh, cross border infrastructure in in three key areas which is uh, transport energy and uh, digital and this is uh, this is happening on uh, uh, national level, uh, this is happening uh, with the use of uh, European funding, uh, and of course with the uh, with the investment uh, fund. Uh, and the, the the biggest biggest achievement so far, because um, uh, there are many projects that are uh, under uh, in, in development right now. But I think the biggest achievement so far is. Um, that uh, so many countries, so many politicians has uh, ha realized that they can work together, that they can uh, that they can see the common goal and see uh, value added in the regional cooperation. Mm, just uh, just uh, half an hour ago, uh, I was. Um, I was I was uh, watching a panel about uh, the transport infra infrastructure, in in which Matthew was was a panelist as well, and there were questions uh, about um, about uh, possible uh, conflict of interests uh, between between the initiative can uh, countries. Why would, for example, Slovenia be happy with a railway connection between? Uh, between uh, Estonia and uh, Lithuania. Well, this is uh, this is what I uh, what I what I meant. Uh, we realized that uh, it's much better to to develop the region as a whole, uh, so we can all benefit from it. And I think this is this is uh, the first biggest uh, biggest success of this of this whole project. But it also uh, has its security dimension, not only in uh, in terms of uh, energy security, uh, but in a very old school um, uh, military security as well. Although it's not, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, one of its uh, key goals, because uh, when we when we work on um, infrastructure, on um, connecting the north and uh, south uh, in the central and, and southern Europe. We also we also build an infrastructure, hopefully that would never uh, be used uh, for uh, NATO troops in case anything bad happens. Uh, our allies will will have the possibility to to intervene. So this is this is the uh, the second dimension of the of the free Seas initiative that is. Uh, Maybe somehow sometimes missed, but I think it's uh, very important as well. Great, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Boyce. So, at beginning in the Trump administration, the United States saw this as not just an opportunity to reduce um, reliance on Russian sources of energy and reduce the Kremlin's potential coercive capacity over the region, but did all, did China also factor into the United States cal calculations for its support for the, for the initiative as a counterweight? Uh, to infrastructure financing through the Belt Road Initiative uh, and digital connectivity? Well, um, I, th I think uh, the, the, the initiative was compelling just in and of itself. I mean, it was just a, it was, the, the idea was, was actually quite uh, ingenious uh, of the, uh, the, the Poles and the Croats who, who conceived it and to build it into what it helped build it, what it into, uh, build it into what it is today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, just the logic behind it, you know, a, a unique private-public pu uh, partnership that leverages uh, the private sector to fill infrastructure gaps that have been left over f uh, because the East said this part of Europe was forced to live under Soviet uh, domination or, or, in this case, whatever, under communism for, uh, for so many, you know, half, almost half a century. And so uh, wh whose, whose region was simply wasn't um, uh, able to develop in the same way as the uh, uh, as the uh, as the region, uh, you know, c countries further to the west, as one of my uh, Polish uh, old Polish friends used to say, um, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, having lived in Poland, had the unfortunate uh, uh, luck to have been uh, 
live in a country which was liberated by tanks with red stars, whereas countries that were live, live sort of to the east, to the west, i.e. Germany, were liberated by tanks with white stars. And, and that forced, you know, forced the Great Leap backward and all these countries which, usually, which were once pretty, uh, very developed, uh, had then been lost so much over the Soviet period, uh, the communist period. But to, but to, to, re, to rebuild that, the, to rebuild all that, it, it just made an awful lot of sense. And um, of, of just in and of itself, to, 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 uh, to help the region, to support the region, um, you know, become, um, uh, you, you know, uh, build Europe whole, free, at peace, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, align the United, uh, transatlantically with, uh, with North America, et cetera. So, so that it made a lot of sense just in and of itself, um, um, uh, just the whole merits of the thing. Um, uh, it, but, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, we, we, we were aware that, uh, that, uh, that, I mean, the Chinese were, uh, were, at, were looking at the region um, where, where the Belt and Road Initiative was, was, was sort of, you know, uh, was, was taking, taking off. Um, and uh, the 17 plus one now, so what, one 16 plus one, then 17 plus now one, 16 plus now 16 plus one again. Um, that was sort of, you know, that initiative was, was, was had, you know, was start, started to take off too. And so, I mean, it was, it was quite clear that the, that the Chinese and the Russians, of course, have been doing this for a longer period of time, uh, using infrastructure projects as vectors to, to spread malign influence in the regions. We've seen it, we've seen it in Africa, we've seen it in Asia, we've seen it in, in you know, uh, I mean, th you know, in Montenegro, I mean, <laughs> you know, next door practically. We've seen it in, in, in all sorts of countries where, um, where uh, dictatorships have been, um, have been using infrastructure, dangling in investments in front of countries and saying, ah, we've got something for you. And, uh, and some countries actually go for this. Um, it's called, some people call it debt trap diplomacy. Others, you know, for, well, have other names for it. But um, what it is, it, 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 it's, it's a way for, for uh, for these countries to to uh, to spread their uh, malign influence into countries where they wouldn't otherwise be present because of uh, of the need for for infrastructure these this massive kind of need to kind of catch up and to 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 um, to, to to reach where you know to reach the level of Western Europe but also to reach the, the level sometimes of where they were before I mean last night for example there was a <laughs> there was a, the mayor of Bled was talking about how the the owner of the hotel down the hill of the uh, Grand Hotel Teplitsa used to commute uh, from uh, daily from Trieste uh, by train. You can't do that. And so that was like, you know, 100 years ago during the Habsburg period, it was actually, there was better infrastructure <laughs> than there is now. Um, and of course, you know, people make the same observation about, um, about you know, coming, you know, trains from, which is not even to mention the, all the digital stuff and, and, the, and the energy connections, et cetera. So, the, the, so but the, the, you know, the, the, this was, this was this, so there was, it was compelling in and of itself, just the idea, uh, you know, uh, helping countries, you know, sort of bring them, let, bring them up, uh, you know, to the to the to where they need to be, where they want to be. Uh, it was a self, you know, it was a unique, uh, self-governing, basically self-starting, you know, group of countries that we saw as, uh, doing this stuff. We said, hey, this is like well done. I mean, good idea. We'd like to sort of be supportive where we can. And, and so we, 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 we started getting more involved and more engaged and supportive of where we can, because we're not members of this exclusive club. We're just, you know, we're, we're partners. We're, uh, we'd like to consider ourselves the best friends, but we're, um, we're you know, we're, we're not members. So we just, we, there's, uh, you know, we, we can't, you know, we can't influence it in any way whatsoever, but we, we can, you know, try to be supportive as, as we can. But the point is that we have, so, so you have this, this, this desire to strengthen, uh, you know, to, to, to developmental per se, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, resilience against uh, against uh, the sort of uh, you know because but, but, you know when it started, of course, um, you know the, the Russians had already been using uh, um, uh, you know energy as a as a as a weapon uh, against uh, the, against the countries of Central Europe and and and, to, and further to the west, uh, using uh, you know infra their infrastructure there to to uh, to to for political purposes. Then you had, of course, um, uh, the uh, and, and the, the sort of the, the growth of, 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 of Chinese interest through the ports after the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, you know, sort of the, the increasing purchasing of infrastructure in Europe, ports, etc. And you think people are starting to think, wait a sec, what's going on here? So you know, sort of, uh, is, is this is this the, is this and is this is this a good thing? And, um, and so, so the, so the, a lot of the, inf the impetus came from the countries themselves, from the, some of the, from the politicians, some of the pundits, the people, the government officials are saying, wait a sec, is this, do we really want this? 
you know, because when you, when you start having, uh, you know, dictatorships uh, or countries that are controlled by dictatorship companies, just controlled by dictatorships, pick, you know, picking off uh, your your ports or other you know key pieces of infrastructure, you start wondering is this is this something that we necessarily want? And and they started asking questions and sort of saying in, in, in many in many cases the answer was no, we don't want this. We want an alternative. We want a a, a Western alternative. We want an alternative that. Um, that is um, that is is much more transparent, much more sustainable, much that operates under Western rules. You know the sort of the the you know the kind of the the kind of rules that, that, that the World Bank or the IMF operate under. You know they're sort of generally accepted. You know the EBRD. These are you know uh, these are basically pretty solid, acceptable and solid rules that that, that most of the of, of you know that so many many countries uh, buy in, you know sort of uh, endorse. And so, and, and that, that, that infrastructure uh, projects should actually be should actually subscribe to those rules, as opposed to whatever other you know rules that uh, that, that might uh, uh, pertain if if the if you know if the if the Russians are involved as they are, for example, in the uh, the Hungarian um, uh, you know the um, Poch, um, uh, nuclear project or the or the railroad that between Belgrade and, and, and Budapest, for example, where there's not exactly a lot of transparency there, and it's also not doesn't exactly operate under under the kinds of you know sort of Standards that one might expect of a World Bank project, for example, um, and so people. So you know, there's there's that, uh, and then you and, and, you know this sort of and then you know the the desire to, the desire to, um, to to sort of to, to add to the because I mean, you know, there are a lot of I I indigenous um, sources of finance for infrastructure. You've got you know national funds, you've got European funds, you've got, you've got Europe, European recovery funds, you've got. Yeah, yeah, but 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 that's but but the needs are are, are really so great that, um, um, that you know the IMF invest uh, has estimated them in the in the sort of the trillion dollar uh, um, kind of uh, order of magnitude for the next uh, say ten years, and 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 the needs are so great that they decided you know so we, we need you know like other sources too, and so so if you look at all this 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 kind of landscape, you you see like what what's not to like about the Three Seasons Initiative? It's like it's a slam dunk yes of course because it. It, 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 it helps uh, you know helps Europe grow together it lifts the countries that were forced to live under under communism for such a long time it lifts them to where they really deserve to be and want to be it, it helps to, you know it helps with the resilience factor it, 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 you know in terms of uh, some of the malign actors that would that seek to actually sort of you know basically influence your influence the countries of these regions that want to be part of the West that have made a civilizational choice to be part of the West but that are um, that are you know that are that are under you know constant bombardment, <laughs> you know through disinformation and uh, you know and, and 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 other sources of malign influence from various sources. It helps them help helps them kind of uh, you know sustain and, and their their choice and, and and to be part of the Western world, which is where they where, where they wanted to be and where they deserve to be. Um, uh, and 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 so we we we've we've really we've tried to be helpful as we can. Thank you. I have a question. I have one more follow-up question for you, and then a question for for you and Radek. Uh, first is is I was wondering how the current administration sees this. Uh, the the previous administration was very enthusiastic uh, and dedicated something like three hundred million dollars at the at the in the later years of the Trump administration. I was wondering if you could shed any light yeah. on the the role of the the Development Finance Corporation. Yeah. Well, so the the previous administration. I mean, this is actually something that started during the Obama period. And then it moved into the Trump period, and the, the Trump administration, the sort of the Obama administration, sort of looking at this and saying, "Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, let's sort of, yeah, very interesting. Let's let's look at the end." But then, but then, of course, the government changed, and then so, uh, and, and and then uh, then the Trump administration looked at it and said, "This is what's what's not to like about this. This is a great idea." So, they, so they started supporting it, and 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 the, and the Biden administration, uh, when they got into office, I mean, even well, even before they got it, they, they were they, they came into office. There, there were some of their um, their, their um, People were, were speaking publicly about three C's and saying this is something that's that, that that's you know, it's a good thing. We continue it. And in fact, then when they actually after January twentieth, they also they, they started uh, they, they you know they, they, their signs of, of, of support were were more uh, were, you know continued as 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 in the past. Um, they, uh, so the, I mean the secretary Secretary Blinken has, has had, um, on multiple occasions endorsed it. Uh, he he's, he uh, delivered a um, a video message to the three C summit in uh, Sofia in July. Uh, the president did as well, and he, the president had a had a statement in there. So, so it was a, a really good one. He said, um, uh, "Hold on, what was it? it? Was along the lines of, we will be your unfailing partner every step of the way.' Was his was his like the sort of the 
uh, so so you get you get his his you know his endorsement there. You have uh, I mean the Secretary of Commerce that gave even a um, a uh, uh, Raimondo she gave a, a video a Mark Weaver or had a, vis a, a, a video uh, in any kind of uh, endorsement really such in such a public way from Secretary of Commerce or for the Commerce Department uh, uh, per se. So I mean so the new administration this is like not really new anymore that <laughs> the, the administration as it um, is it has been quite in, uh, quite quite supportive of it in fact. Um, through the DFC, um, the, the Development Finance Corporation has been has been a little um, has, has been sort of ha you know once once you have a break in administrations or transition, you sort of there's always a period of sort of sorting out like what are you going to do and how are you going to do it, et cetera, and who's going to do it, and so there's been a little bit of a of a of a, of a lag a lag time as they've sort of sorted that out, but it's the, the discussions are, are advanced with uh, with the Amber Fund. Which is the the, the 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 fund manager that's going to develop, that, that administers the three C's initiative investment fund, and so I'm I'm um, I'm um, cautiously optimistic that that'll reach a conclusion very soon. Um, so um, so there, there will be also you know uh, U.S. money there. Um, the money, of course, is not a contribution. It's it's not development assistance. It's it's an investment in a, in concrete projects which are designed to uh, deliver a return on investment, which is attractive. And um, and and, um, and and of course, then therefore be uh, be a net benefit for the taxpayer and for the treasury. And of course, this is the same basis that every uh, that all the other um, uh, investors in the fund um, are operating under. Is, is I mean, in addition to having their the sort of the, the, the broader goals out there, they're also um, um, they're also um, you know um, expecting. An ROI, which is which is which is which is all which is fine because that's that R that return on investment, which which uh, um, you know uh, which you know sort of uh, you know, which the investors are expecting will is, is designed to be sufficiently attractive to um, to additional investors, the sort of the, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, the the institutional investors, the the, so the, 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 the capital markets out there that have, that are that have. You know, rather large amounts of money, billions, you know, billions every day that are sort of circling the globe, looking for places to land. And this area is such an at attractive one, of you know, sort of in terms of growth, et cetera, that they are, um, that that you know, that 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 that's, uh, you know, assuming the fund does well, that this will attract more investors because you know the the you know because the needs are uh, the, the infrastructure needs are really quite great, and you need a lot of. Um, and, and you, you know you you need more capital than than some of the seed capital that's been provided so far. So I, I, I'm 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 opt really optimistic about this. I think it's going to uh, you know that, that, that we're going to get to yes uh, with regard to the, the fund and the modalities of all that because there are various co uh, congressionally and um, and other uh, and, and, and sort of regulations that are under which the DFC operates that that sometimes are a little bit more cumbersome than if you're just a uh, you know just a Norwegian sovereign wealth fund or whatever. But uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it has it has a lot of uh, a lot of potential. Yeah. So the initiative uh, seems to leave out uh, Western Balkan countries that are considered to be prime targets of China's investment investment through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I was wondering what the logic is of keeping this contained to the 12 EU member states. Do you think this is a strategic oversight, or or is there other plan? Uh, well, uh, as we can see, as um, uh, it uh, as it was mentioned here. Yeah, this this is the the area, the Western Balkan, but not only. We all know uh, who's uh, now own, uh, the owner of, of Port of uh, Piraeus in uh, in Athens, and this is the area of, of uh, influence for um, uh, for China as, uh, and uh, of course uh, that the Free Seas Initiative is not going to uh, block anyone's uh, decisions, but. Uh, I think uh, the freezes provide a decent and, and transparent uh, initiative because uh, we all we all know what's the modus operandi of uh, China is in in that case. Uh, Matthew mentioned that uh, it's basically, hey, we're gonna fix this for you. So uh, we're gonna build your uh, roads. We're gonna build your uh, railways. We're gonna invest uh, in your infrastructure, but there are always uh, strings attached. And this part of uh, Europe, and uh, by this I mean the, the Central um, and Eastern Europe and the, the partly South, Southern Europe, is definitely underdeveloped. The, the, uh, the case of the stars on the tanks uh, is, still, uh, is still something that uh, is uh, unfortunately going on. 
uh, and it was uh, a very easy choice and easy money for uh, for uh, for many. Uh, and uh, we should uh, definitely, as, as uh, NATO members, as EU members, we should uh, be. Uh, well, we, we, we should we should make a we should see the difference between uh, between uh, between the uh, aggressive uh, investment strategies of uh, authoritarian countries uh, and uh, the democratic uh, solutions. So, if the Free Seas Initiative uh, can provide an alternative, can uh, provide. Uh, an alternative funding or can be uh, helpful in terms let's uh, let's build this railway together you don't need uh, you don't need a foreign investor you don't need an asian investor we can uh, we can uh, fund it uh, uh, within the free initiative it this uh, can be the case and i hope it can and it it uh, already proves uh, it's working this will be one of the tremendous successes of the of the whole thing. So I want to get into a different different aspect of the conversation. I think that when we're talking about lack of alternatives, I think this becomes much more clear, uh, especially when it comes to digital connectivity. Digital connectivity is still a very important branch of the Three Cs Initiative. Uh, to what extent has that been developed under under TSI? Um, what are the what are the critical what are the critical projects on that? that after that point, we'll, we'll move to we'll bring in May, our, our other panelists, who, who can talk a little bit more about uh, the digital Silk Road. Okay. I can. Okay. <laughs> now we're good. Uh, well, ov obviously. The, the biggest challenge right now is the 5G infrastructure uh, when it comes to uh, digital, and we all know the challenges uh, with. Uh, uh, okay, uh, the, the challenges that are connected with it when it comes to the um, uh, infrastructure providers, uh, but it's it's not only that; it's uh, it's cloud computing. Uh, Panel uh, uh, representative was uh, was telling about uh, about an acquisition of a, a cloud computing company that can provide uh, infrastructure for the for the whole uh, region. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, as, I, as I said, there are three uh, three uh, legs of, of the three C's: the transport, energy, and and digital. And uh, I think digital may become more and more uh, more and more uh, important. Uh, it's uh, in in very in very different uh, dimensions, uh, starting from uh, from the five G and then security infrastructure. A digital security infrastructure, uh, finishing with uh, household uh, bandwidth that uh, proved so important during uh, during uh, pandemic. I recently read an uh, an article uh, proposing uh, a common free seas initiative uh, cyber uh, security center that would uh, be able to. Uh, counter, uh, counteract uh, attacks from uh, from uh, east for for example uh, my my own country is experiencing it uh, right now we had a, a bunch of uh, hacker attacks on uh, parliamentarians and and the government ministers try, uh, that were that were targeting their uh, their emails some of them fortunate unfortunately uh, so this this uh, this shows how important is the digital dimension of the um, uh, free SI. Uh, so so Maya, I'd like to bring you in here. Uh, the fault line of Sino-US competition has really kind of fallen along telecommunications and and global connectivity or digital connectivity. Um, 
and and I think that we when we talk about the BRI, it's a little bit outdated to simply con continue to talk about infrastructure investment in, in, into into um, uh, ports and roads alone. Uh, they've really we've kind of seen a, a shift, uh, a large contraction in investment in that area, and kind of doubling down on the digital Silk Road. I was wondering if you could really tell us about kind of what is this digital Silk Road, and is is this something that we should be weary of, or or what are the what are the who are the actors at play here? Thank you, Jack. That's a, a really good question. Um, and just to clarify, when we talk about the contraction of the Belt and Road Initiative, what we're talking about is the contraction of new investment into the Belt and Road Initiative. What we found in our research at IISS is that actually the implementation of certain projects that might have been signed years and years and years ago, uh, early on in the Belt and Road Initiative, continues to actually peak in terms of implementation around 2018-2019. Uh, um, so um, a, a little bit of nuance there. But when it comes to the digital Silk Road, I think it's really important to understand that the digital Silk Road, or DSR in short, isn't just a digital BRI. That's how Beijing portrays the digital Silk Road. It's a sub-initiative under the BRI label that was launched in 2015, supposedly to help fill the gap uh, of socioeconomic development through digital connectivity uh, to promote the growth of digital economies in countries around the world, and it's seen as almost a substrand when you look at Chinese text. But actually, if you look at how the digital Silk Road uh, is actually unpacked in policy statements and in official uh, statements from Beijing, uh, how it has evolved, and also uh, when you look at the projects themselves, we soon come to realize that actually it's not a like for like. It's actually that something that's far more fluid far more expansive beyond the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and, uh, and, and has uh, almost a characteristic of its own. So I think the difficulty here when we talk about the digital Silk Road is that because there's such a lack of, um, I think, clear definition in Beijing and coming out of Beijing about what this is, that we can almost take a maximalist or a minimalist approach to understanding this. We can either look at the technologies that simply have to do with what Beijing uh, claims the digital Silk Road is for, and we can look at, therefore, at things like 5G connectivity or submarine cables or data centers, or we can look at actually the whole span of activity in the digital sphere that Chinese companies are active in, and that goes beyond to things like um, databases on genetics uh, and genetic, genetic information. So there's this really wide scope, and I think the problem with that is that that doesn't help our understanding of what this is, and it doesn't also help our own policy implementation for how to deal with the challenges that the digital Silk Road or certain digital activity by Chinese actors uh, might uh, present. So at the IISS, I'm leading on a project called China Connect that uh, seeks to map uh, the digital Silk Road, and we've come down to an initial uh, 10, now 13 uh, categories of projects, and these span across the tech stack, so the pyramid of technologies, from the basic uh, foundational technologies, physical technologies of uh, 5G, but of course also pre-5G technologies and, and national infrastructure networks, to things like submarine cables and terrestrial cables, uh, physical data centers, and moving up to services and platforms. So think here of things like smart city projects, uh, what Beijing or Huawei calls safe city projects, anything to do with uh, databases and surveillance technologies linked to law enforcement, uh, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth, moving all the way to investments in fintech and e-commerce and e-government. Um, of course, over the past few years that we've seen with uh, COVID, uh, this has also evolved to include new categories. So now there's an emphasis on training and education from Beijing along digital lines. There's an emphasis on e-health projects that have been drawn into uh, this understanding, this nebulous label of uh, digital Silk Road. Uh, and similarly, we see an increasing investment by Chinese companies active along the digital Silk Road in, uh, in third party or recipient country uh, startups in, in these types of uh, projects and categories. So um, it's not the BRI because of the actors that are involved. Um, these are private sector actors in addition to state-owned enterprises and of course the infamous quasi, uh, however you would like to define a, a company like Huawei. Um, there's different financing models um, depending on the type of project that you're looking at. So whilst in the BRI we look at a heavy investment by Chinese policy banks, a big role of the state in that, 
when it comes to the digital Silk Road, aside from physical infrastructure, when we look at the other types of projects that are on top of that, um, actually the role of policy banks becomes less and less. And furthermore, uh, I think, again, uh, the scope of this uh, really expands beyond uh, just the BRI. In terms of how countries become a digital Silk Road uh, country, um, you know, there's very few countries that, and companies actually in China, that use this label of the digital Silk Road. The digital Silk Road label is one that's used primarily by the Chinese uh, government uh, and the CCP. However, when it comes to countries who accept this uh, technology, that doesn't automatically, in their eyes, make them a digital Silk Road country. So how do we define that moving forward? There's no easy list of memorandums of understanding for countries who have signed on to this. Um, within our data set of around 1,800 projects so far, there's a couple of trends that we can see for how this has evolved over time. And the first trend that I'd point to is that just like the BRI, uh, there is a, a, a foundational, um, uh, foundational history of activity along lines of physical uh, infrastructure investment by Chinese companies around the world uh, that predate the digital Silk Road label. So once again, um, Beijing is using activity that has already existed, repackaging it for um, a, a political and strategic purpose. Um, the trends also show that we see a shift in the types of uh, categories of projects that are prominent year by year that have started. So pre-DSR, we saw heavy investment in mainly physical infrastructure uh, technology, so rollouts of national, uh, national telecommunications networks. Uh, and since the launch of the Digital Silk Road, we've seen an increasing diversity in the types of projects, an increasing number of projects started per year by Chinese companies uh, like ZTE, Huawei, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and so on and so forth. Um, this, I think, could be rationally reflected in our data set. We're not able to say that there is a causal relationship or a correlation. But what I would say is that um, over time, of course, new technologies have become more available. The Chinese market has become more saturated. And so in a commercial sense, it makes sense for these Chinese companies to look for new markets abroad. Um, I think it also could reflect the changing needs in countries uh, that are receiving on the receiving end of these projects, whereby old uh, generations of technology need upgrades. And so we see Chinese companies take advantage of that, building on longstanding relationships to continue that engagement in digital investment. I'd say the peak of um, the digital Silk Road hasn't yet be seen. Uh, I think they're definitely uh, overall, I think in terms of physical infrastructure, the peak was definitely seen around probably 2018, 2019 um, with regards to 5G technology. But on the other hand, all other types of investment continue to grow year on year. Um, the other thing that I'd mention is that with regards to the Belt and Road Initiative, we see sometimes reports of ghost projects, projects that have been signed but haven't necessarily resulted or projects that have um, been announced but have never been started or completed. That's not something that we see reflected very much in our data set. We see that for the majority of, for the vast majority of projects, those that have been signed, announced, have commenced and within a few years have been quickly completed. And I think that again points to this one need for infrastructure in countries that has already been mentioned by uh, my uh, fellow panelists, but also um, again probably uh, the uh, in help of Chinese state policy banks for physical infrastructure when it comes to making this uh, technology available at a cheaper price, but also of course um, having it rolled out quickly and uh, uh, and available uh, much quicker than alternatives uh, potentially. So what way forward for the DSR before I hand over back to you, Jack? Um, I think from our data set, what we've seen is that pushback so far has been more limited than perhaps has been reflected uh, in, in news media. Um, I think um, the way that we count pushback is to look at uh, companies and contracts that have officially been halted and canceled. And when we look at that, we see that around one-fifth of projects uh, have been officially halted or canceled with regards to, say, 5G technology. But again, that pushback so far, I think, has been limited to 5G technology, whereas, again, the digital Silk Road is something that's much broader than just 5G technology. We should think about all the other different areas where Chinese uh, companies are present and active uh, and the ways uh, that, that there might be concerns about that. 
Um, we have seen moves, of course, in the United States to think about legislation uh, and uh, a framework whereby to judge uh, the software of uh, the, the risks posed by Chinese software and platforms and apps. Um, so I think that's an interesting development that might yield um, greater uh, potential uh, collaboration and coordination uh, transatlantically in the future. Um, the last point that I wanted to make is that overall countries that I've seen uh, in the data set are still um, by and large trying to hedge between the United States and China when it comes to digital technology. And I know that that's something that we'll talk more about in uh, the discussion later on, so I won't go into too much detail about that uh, later. The very, very last thing is that, of course, this doesn't only have to do with how, company, how countries receive uh, Chinese technology. It, of course, also very much has to do with the changing relationship between the private sector and uh, the CCP and the state in China as well. Um, and so how that uh, might affect the digital Silk Road moving forward, I think, is also an interesting point to look forward to. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that I have a question that, that would tie together our first three panelists uh, and, and begin to move towards the, the rest of the conversation with, with Matt and Marika. Um, obviously, there are large needs with digital connectivity. Um, and, and initially with the three season initiative, I believe China was very supportive of it, especially with the digital connectivity uh, aspect to it. So, so really with these needs, why are we resist, why do we resist this? Is it worth resisting? Uh, is, or what is incompatible about this? Or what, or what are the risks that we're undertaking here? So I think um, with regards to the risks and the challenges posed by Chinese uh, technology, obviously the links between um, the private sector and obviously the state-owned enterprises in China and the Chinese government is one of concern. Um, so is the legislative framework within China that requires uh, cooperation on intelligence between uh, people, uh, individuals, companies, uh, and organizations uh, with uh, the party in the state. Um, the other challenge, of course, in addition to this intelligence uh, question, is a question of uh, whether or not there are uh, so-called back doors within Chinese technology, whereby network uh, critical national infrastructures could be shut down or, uh, or leveraged in some way in order to coerce a country at a time of uh, political uh, contention or crisis. Um, and, and the last uh, point, of course, which I think our fellow speakers will talk about, is one of disinformation used, uh, or, or uh, the way that Chinese companies might play a role in, uh, in further disinformation challenges uh, in our countries. Thank you very much. Uh, do you guys have a comment to make on that? If, if not, if not, actually, I do have a, I, I have a question there, especially on the disinformation uh, aspect, and and then something actually, uh, Marika, I'm going to go to Matt first, if if you don't mind, and but but please do jump in here, um, Matt. You actually see a lot of structural similarities between energy dependence on Russia uh, and the market dependence on China. Uh, I was wondering what some of the unspoken costs and unmitigatable risks, not from not from a security point of view, but perhaps from an intelligence point of view, of choosing China as a funder for infrastructure, supplier of digital technology, or as or as an export market. Uh, can we comfortably comfortably divide these things and mitigate these risks, in your opinion? Um, so, well, so first of all, um, this is this is sort of sort of the polite thing to say at the beginning of this thing, but I actually do really want to say it's a privilege to be joining you folks up here. This is a very smart and accomplished group of people. Um, I am neither a European nor a Europeanist, um, as Deputy Assistant Secretary Boyce is, uh, simply just an American who has spent too much time thinking about China. Um, so it's a pleasure to be able to join you guys, and I've already learned quite a bit from uh, listening to you guys. I was just found myself nodding the whole time you were talking, Maya. Um, the question of perhaps some of the unappreciated risks associated with, uh, with connectivity in China, both in the digital and the economic space, is, is something that I'm extremely interested in and spend a lot of time thinking about and talking to people about. Um, and I was really struck by actually a comment of yours, Deputy Assistant Secretary Boyce. Can I just say Daz Boyce? That's a mouthful, Matt. Okay. Um, I was really struck by something you said in your comments, um, Matt, where, where we saw the initial push into Europe in 
you know, right after the global financial crisis where people were sort of, they didn't quite understand what was happening. It was kind of, we have these folks showing up at our doorstep. Um, they've brought a lot of money. They seem interested in investing in our infrastructure. This, uh, this seems nice. Um, I think one of the things that I really find that people still don't quite appreciate is the extent to which politics and economics are um, seen as linked at the pinnacle of the party state in China. Um, the extent to which it's believed very strongly by uh, the folks who run China, um, particularly Xi Jinping, um, that politics, that economics should serve politics. Um, and very much not the other way around. Um, I, th I think in the United States and in Europe, we sort of, um, we've been, uh, you know, if I can use a word that's been overused, uh, the, the neoliberal mindset is sort of that, that economics exists alongside politics or that economics perhaps even, or that politics perhaps sometimes even sort of economics. Um, and that's very, very much not the case in the party state's view. Um, and for, I believe because of that mindset, it was one of the primary reasons that we made the mistake in a lot of Western societies of believing, of sort of um, mirroring our values onto China when the decision was made to, to work to draw the PRC more deeply into this set of global institutions that we call globalization, the international community. Um, it was because the depth of this connection between politics and economics was not fully appreciated that I think we believed that their institutions could evolve in a way that would look more like ours. Um, and instead, what has happened is we've seen the increasing involvement of the PRC party state um, in all of these institutions we call the international community while the, the determination of the party state to make politics, to make economics serve politics has just fundamentally not really changed. Um, th there's a, I see a lot of talk in, um, not so much in the United States, but you know, in, in Europe, places throughout the Asia Pacific, that sort of Xi Jinping was kind of the big discontinuity and kind of everything changed after Xi Jinping came to office. I see Maya kind of laughing a little bit. Um, He's certainly a stepwise change, but he in no way represents a fundamental change uh, in the direction of the party state. Um, you know, at, at one point a few months ago, when I was bored one day, I went back and looked at where China was at on the uh, Reporters Without Borders rankings for press freedom from the year that it began. Um, and you know, if you look at the rankings from the supposed heyday of Chinese liberalism under Jiang Zemin into the beginning of the Hu Jintao era from you know, the, 2000, the early 2000s up until 2012, uh, China was never further than like third from the bottom. I, I think they made it to seventh from the bottom in one year. Um, and we're talking about out of like 180, 200 countries that are ranked. So you know, the discontinuity between Xi Jinping and uh, other leaders I think has been vastly, vastly oversold. Um, and one of the fundamental defining features of the relationship between politics and economics in the party state's view, and you've seen it in how they've, how they've managed their own society or attempted to manage their own society over the past 30 or 40 years since uh, they opened up their economy, um, is that the party state can and should use economics as a lever to deter criticism. Um, as a way to deter folks who would think, well, both to deter criticism uh, and to reward people who choose not to criticize or undertake to support the party state's goals. I think it's important to say both sides of that coin because I think we tend to focus a lot on the coercion and if you look at writings in the party state on, on sort of how the politics of all this is supposed to work, they actually focus a lot more on on making sure that folks who are supportive are rewarded. Um, so that, that's kind of one of the fundamental features of the relationship between politics and economics. And so it should not have come as a surprise, but it really has, where we've seen increasing connectivity between the PRC economy 
and the rest of the world that we've seen the application of this philosophy to the rest of the world, um, where there is a, a really marked willingness to use this economic, uh, and in some cases digital, connectivity um, as a way to, uh, let's call it, shape the mental space of elites in other societies, um, to communicate uh, either directly or through proxies that there will be costs associated with um, speaking out or directly opposing things that are seen as important to the PRC party state. Um, and as the party state's interests have grown, so too has the range of things that become important as interest to the party states. 30 years ago, it was very, very traditional kind of, um, you know, Tibet, Taiwan, Tiananmen, Xinjiang, just don't cross these red lines. Uh, and like now we're seeing um, basically economic warfare against Australia uh, for more or less just passing a set of laws that were meant to shore up like how it handles um, you know the the involvement of foreign actors in its elections in universities um, and a number of other things in Australia these were actually actions taken mostly just to defend the institutions of Australia um, and the result of that has been um, you know Australia has seen sanctions against uh, its coal exports to China. Uh, one of its most important, like one of the most important sectors of Australia, its entire economy. I mean, like, it's not much of an exaggeration to say that Australia's economic growth the past 20 or 30 years has basically just come from digging Western Australia up and shipping it to China. Um, and so once you start talking about sanctions against uh, the coal sector, the wine sector has gotten hammered by sanctions. Um, there's been threats against the educational sector. You know, the Australian education sector is, um, not gonna, it's not dependent upon Chinese students, but, you know, in, in the case of some of the country's elite institutions, you're seeing like, you know, 20, 30% of their tuition fees come from Chinese students, and there's been threats to, to choke off the flow of visas from the uh, Chinese ambassador in Australia. Um, so, like, Australia is very, very much the most a uh, prominent example of this, and it's one that I think folks in Europe are surprisingly not, um, maybe not surprisingly, Australia's a long way away. Um, but it's one that I think it, a lot of folks in Europe would do well to study more closely, um, because we're actually starting to see attempts to apply this kind of stuff here in Europe as well. Lithuania got crosswise with China about a week and a half ago over uh, Lithuania's relationship to Taiwan. And we're now seeing like outright threats to Lithuania's exports to China, uh, which you know Lithuania, I, I believe, two percent of their exports go to China. Uh, so Lithuania is just like, oh no, anything but that. Um, it's not much of a threat to Lithuania, um, but we've seen attempts to do that in the case of the Czech Republic as well, um, and it's been reported in the press that. Um, uh, you know, it's the German government has had it communicated to it that their decision on Huawei will have ramifications for uh, the ability of the German auto industry to do business inside of China. Uh, and China is Volkswagen's most important market. It's the place where they sell the most cars. I believe it's the place where they manufacture the most cars. Um, so I, I don't think there's really been an appreciation of this relationship between politics and economics in Europe. Uh, and now that China is more embedded in our economic institutions, we're sort of coming to this realization. But I think a lot of folks have not really gotten to the place where they sort of, it's not even really about your strategic sectors, it's really just about the economic relationship with China as a whole. Uh, that like if you sell a lot of stuff to China that actually could potentially become a political lever It doesn't matter whether it's semiconductor chips or wheat um, That there's going to be a political dimension with your relationship and you need to be conceiving of your economic policy towards China with this in mind And, and with that I'd like to go to Marika um, Especially when we get into sort of the application of what this means in terms of infrastructure uh, How how does the digital Silk Road fit into a, a quest for for narrative dominance or discourse power or uh, and Matt you also jump in here 
Uh, where have we seen kind of the combined use of control over digital platforms infrastructure in order to wield um, and, and to shape information spaces, information spaces or to suppress negative narratives about the Chinese Communist Party in the world? And so should we be considering this when we consider our, our, our um, digital connectivity infrastructure needs? Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, before I go into your question about, you know, Belt and Road as a form of shaping the discourse, I, I kind of want to take a step back and address some of the fuzzy nature of the Belt and Road Initiative, and I think we've kind of been dancing around a little bit on this panel here, and how it is both less and more. Now, I think the, the aspect of why it could be less is fairly well known, that, you know, some stuff hasn't actually manifested, some of it has. In some cases, there has been disenchantment actually on the part of some countries that they didn't actually get the investment that they were hoping for, in part because I think this image of, oh, China is going to come in and save us all uh, was so dominant that, you know, people had, you know, those expectations that now China is going to come in and rescue everybody. Um, and of course, that that doesn't pan out, and it, it's gonna it's gonna continue to shrink with everything with the developments we've actually seen domestically in China, when China is also, you know, rebalancing a little bit what it does internationally. Um, but I, I want to talk mainly about how the BRI is actually more than what we usually understand, and we've already, you know, touched on that um, when when Maya talked about how you know it's sometimes it's very hard to define what the digital Silk Road is, and the same is true for the Belt and Road Initiative as a whole. And that is because of the way that, in a way, it's very typical of how Chinese politics are made. It's basically, you throw out a slogan, a TIFA, that's usually done at the top. In the case of the Belt and Road Initiative, it was two speeches given by Xi Jinping, and then you have a TIFA, this catchphrase. And then, basically, everybody and their grandmother in the Chinese system, every ministry, every local government, every company is supposed to study the spirit of you know, that important speech, and find ways for them to implement this catchphrase, this new catchphrase, in their own work. And this is why you don't just have investment in infrastructure. This is why you have you know, the Arctic Silk Road, because some people work on that. You have the Digital Silk Road. You have the Space Silk Road. You now, under COVID, have the Health Silk Road. You have initiatives in all kinds of areas. You, know, you have cooperation mechanisms in for the media, for culture and arts, for, um, for legal advice, for you know, spreading the social credit system. That also exists, um, even though it's not super active. So that, that's, that's why this is so fuzzy, because basically everybody is supposed to get involved and bring in their own initiatives in some form or another. Some of it is a lot more centrally organized than other. Uh, initiatives. Some of these are very much encouraged by the state. In other cases, you may actually have companies jumping on the bandwagon and, as has already been made, ma been mentioned, reframing some of their projects as falling under the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and this is, on the one hand, why this is so difficult to grasp, but this is also why you see the Belt and Road Initiative pop up in so many sectors and why it is, in a way, in a way, a way to frame the conversation about global connectivity that is highly China-centric. So it's basically China has put itself at the center and it's managing all these different relationships. Now, when I talk about this kind of connectivity, one thing I want to make clear is what we're not going to see is um, a, a world order, even let's say that you know the Belt and Road works perfectly, the way that the Chinese government envisions that. We're not gonna see a world order where China becomes necessarily a power that uses alliances like the United States does. We often, when we talk about, you know, China might replace the United States, we think very much in terms of how, how the United States works, and I think this is, this is uh, false. These mechanisms are not, they're not multilateral, they're basically loosely tied connections, often bilateral, which helps China a lot, because in any bilateral relationship, China is most of the time, and with very few exceptions, always going to be the bigger country that can always, or most of the time, um, set the rules. Um, unless countries band together, there has been some pushback, of course, but by and large, China is a larger country and can shape how something is done. And then these are not necessarily used as established institutions, but rather as loose networks through which 
various Chinese institutions are in touch with other institutions from their field internationally and can do precisely what Matt mentioned. That is, you know, dish out rewards and punishments and make sure that various actors are in alignment with the goals of the Chinese government. Um, and when they're not, once you have more entanglement of the sort via various, um, via various channels, you're, it's easier to mete out punishment. In part, I think some of that is psychological. Um, I, I do think we often actually overestimate the effect or the damage that can be done. As we see with Lithuania currently, there's just not a whole lot that China can do to harm Lithuania. Uh, its economy is just not that exposed. Um, but we do have this idea that, oh, if we offend China, it's horrible. So we see things like, you know, um, and to take a ridiculous example of theaters that are in the Silk Road Theater Alliance suddenly canceling shows because, you know, the Chinese ambassador in that country said to them, you can't have this, otherwise you're going to get kicked out of the Silk Road Theater Alliance. That's, of course, a tiny and sort of ridiculous example. But, but the idea is that once you have this massive network where everybody is involved in building the Silk Road, you have various ways of actually interfering in that way, trying to make sure that any member who's involved in that kind of stays in line and doesn't really does anything that is outside of China's interest. And again, I think here, here it's, it's kind of really important to understand that what is defined as these political questions or interests, that's a field that's expanding. Um, it's going to keep growing. We've seen this already in China. The sphere of what is considered political and therefore sensitive and to be controlled has already been expanding. And we've seen it closer to, to, to Chinese borders, and we're increasingly, I think, going to see it here. Um, I'm going to stop for now, but happy to you know, um, have follow-up questions or, or chat some more. Uh, I, I've seen that May has been taking copious notes. I was wondering if, you, if she wanted to respond first before I move on to another question. No, I think um, I, I think both speakers made really excellent points, and particularly the last one where we overestimate the uh, coercive power uh, of the Chinese. I think is a really important one that warrants a lot more research. Um, actually, putting facts out there to say, well, if economic coercion has um, has been uh, attempted by the Chinese state, has there actually been follow through? Um, have economies actually suffered? Um, so I, I think that's really important. And Further by the way, if anybody wants to fund Maya's research on that, you know, please do get in touch. Um, furthermore, I think another really interesting point uh, here is um, the more that countries come together, like-minded countries come together and form a coordinated response to some of China's, uh, uh, the challenges that China poses, I think the more and more uh, there might be concern in Beijing whether old tactics are still useful. And for my conversations with um, some Chinese interlocutors, I feel like there's still a, a, an overemphasis still holding on, trying to hold on to these old uh, methods and means of influence, um, but uh, it, and I sense an increasing concern on their part that that might not always work for very much longer in the future. And so, um, you know, how do we how do we deal with that, and how do we uh, watch for any potential changes that might result? Please, Matt. Uh, I could just pick up on something that Matt said. That I thought was uh, interesting. And sort of this link between economics and politics, but there's also another aspect to it. It is. Um, it's a sort of. It, it, it's the that the the. the um, what you know, what the uh, Germans during Ostpolitik used to call Wandel durch Handel or Wandel durch Annäherung, which means they would, de the more you trade with, you know, uh, dictatorships, like in the, it started off with the Soviet Union, but now it's extended into chi uh, communist China, uh, this mentality that, you know, if you just trade with them enough, they will sort of become like us. And, um, and they'll be, you know, sort of, uh, and, 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 or Wandel durch Annäherung, the same concept, or a similar concept developed, uh, 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 you know, also with regard to the uh, Soviet Union is is actually you know sort of been applied to to China uh, and um, and you know sort of this 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 template that a lot of people bought into this template it's not just the Germans with regard to Ch Soviet Union and China it's also uh, we did it in the United States uh, to some extent uh, so there was a uh, there was a greed factor involved there was a profit factor involved but there was also an ideology factor involved you know let's let's just you know, let's just engage with them, and now you know over time they'll become like us. Well, they became a lot more prosperous, that's for sure. But they sure didn't change in any other way. 
In fact, they even got, wor I don't know, maybe they, did they get worse or they got like, you know, similarly bad or whatever. They continue, the, the trends, at, well, maybe the, the, the surveillance state has gotten much more effective, and so maybe it has gotten worse. Their military has gotten worse, and so it's actually gotten worse. And, and we've, we bought into this template uh, and this, this mindset, this, uh, this like worldview, which was like totally false. Uh, and totally naive, and um, and, it, and, it, and I think you know even the Germans who developed the concepts in the first place have also sort of slowly come to to, to the realization that this is actually uh, not really working. Although there's still a substantial constituency in the country that th still believes in it, and of course there is a st substantial co constituency in a lot, a lot of countries that still believe in it um, uh, for whatever reason, whether they you know whether it's profit motive, whether it's just interest, or whether it's Maybe even naivete or ideology or whatever else, but the fact is, it's still is is, is still out there. It's surprisingly, um, and of course, the Chinese have been extremely effective at um, at buying their way into Western institutions, Western societies. It's the money sloshing around is just incredible, and, and and of course, people are you know sort of respond to that uh, incentive often. Uh, but um, but it but it is changing though. I mean, um, even with her, even with you know with, with I had a conversation last night with a, an interesting uh, German um, person who was um, who was t who was describing how even in Germany this is actually really sinking in in terms of their dependence on um, on um, on on the uh, on the Chinese market. Um, you know, you're, I think maybe what you were referring to uh, that the, 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 for, the for Volkswagen uh, dependency. Is there, I think the Chinese ambassador to Germany in 2019 once said, "That's a nice car factory you have in China. Yes. It would be a shame if anything were to happen to it." You know, uh, sort of like them, which, of course, you know, we understand the mafia um, mentality there, and. Um, and then, of course, you know, whenever this happens, then the antennae start quivering, and people say, "Whoa, whoa, wait a second. And then they call up the chancellor, and they say, "You can't do anything that will piss the Chinese off because, you know, because of Volkswagen, right? You know, and they, they get, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So it's really, and of course, this happens, uh, you know, in other ways as well, in much more subtle ways. Um, but, um, but I mean, there is a recognition that this is, uh, this is, this is recognition is, is changing. Um, just as in our in, in the United States, we've we've you know changed you know sort of you know on a bipartisan basis uh, uh, coming to you know sort of come to the conclusion that this is a serious long-term challenge. Um, uh, it also is happening in, in Europe, maybe a little slower, um, but but also happening. Um, and um, you know uh, we've been engaged in a, di a dialogue with a lot of different you know, bilaterally as well as multilaterally with the EU just to sort of make sure that to, to sort of maybe, you know sort of. You know, like d develop this idea and 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 get get more buy into the the fact that this is a, a serious long term challenge that they also have to think about because it affects their security and not only their economic, you know, not only their pocketbook, et cetera, and their, and their economies, et cetera. So, um, it, it's 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 a slow process. Uh, it's going to take a lot more um, sort of argument and debate, et cetera, before people really sort of I think uh, I think you know uh, you know sort of. Uh, Draw the necessary conclusions that uh, that this is uh, something that they really have to care about. Uh, like it's not just uh, investor uh, invest, you know, sort of uh, you know, sort of CFIUS type uh, institutions, investor screening legislation and and scrutiny of of, of what uh, of business deals and, and 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 you know, kind of an awareness of the pernicious effect of the Confucius Institute networks that that are um, that are just uh, you know that are changing the the. The, the culture of debate or the culture of, of academic freedom uh, yeah, uh, in, in universities and, and elsewhere, uh, but also just degree, applying more scrutiny to the whole uh, China uh, challenge. Um, and it's it, it's a slower it's a slow it's a slow process it's a slog, but it's it's something that is having a, a bit of an effect. And um, and the, the, you know sort of it, it but it but it requires I think a lot more, and that's that's why we're sort of continuing to you know dialogue with the. With Europeans bilaterally and otherwise to, to, to try to uh, you know to, to sort of you know build, build support for consent consent you know build support for for uh, a, a more uh, a much more critical look at what this involves for their own sovereignty for their own um, you know for for the for the, the you know the, the rules-based international order from which Europe has, has prospered so mightily over the last uh, you know 75 years and so it's a really um, it's, it's really important that we continue these kinds of conversations at all levels of society, and, you know, in, 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 you know, sort of um, to 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 to, uh, to 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 you know to build consensus for for what you know our children or grandchildren are going to what kind of a world they're going to live in if if this if this doesn't if this doesn't change. Uh, so sorry. Yeah. I just have one more question for our. The, just a very quick. 
No, but I, I think it's worth uh, pointing out uh, when Matt was um, talking about Chinese uh, policy towards uh, Australia and uh, the, uh, the way they are trying to, uh, to punish uh, Australian economy, it, it sounded uh, unfortunately familiar for, uh, for me and I think this sounds familiar for uh, many uh, Central and Eastern European countries because that's the same um, uh, mindset, the same way of thinking uh, that uh, Russia uh, has and uh, used to implement in the um, uh, in the past uh, when it comes to uh, energy um, uh, sources. We do all remember when they were shutting down the uh, gas uh, uh, transportation just in order to punish uh, Ukraine. So I think we should uh, learn from that and uh, well, also the Free Seas Initiative is one of the answers to to fight those, uh, those, um, uh, they did this this way of, of uh, conducting uh, global uh, global politics uh, through energy or, or through economic uh, means. That's that's why one of the uh, important uh, dimensions is the energy security and the, the diversification of energy sources. But uh, yeah, because this is not new uh, and we can clearly see that uh, authoritarian minds think alike. So uh, we should, we should uh, definitely learn uh, from, from that and, and draw conclusions and implement uh, them on, on threads like, uh, like this. Uh, thank you, Radek. That's perfect. Uh, actually, th that leads us to the next kind of group question. Uh, especially if we're learning from 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 our historical memory or or from things that are actually currently happening, we still have the same we still have the same infrastructure needs. We have about I think IMF estimated still 600 billion in terms of the entire in terms of the entire region. Um, actually, but Jack, can I just do a yeah, really please. quick comment please, on please, something please. that other Matt said? Yes, I, I don't want to drag us too far away from infrastructure, but just sort of one thing he said that I wanted to comment on real quickly was sort of like the. Again, this notion that like China would become more like us, um, I, I just I just wanted to comment that I I think I I think a big part of the reason that happened was sort of, uh, if I can be candid, uh, Western arrogance in the 1990s and 2000s. You know, the the end of history, fall of the Berlin Wall, Berlin Wall into the Cold War. Uh, and there was sort of the presumption that the rest of the world were uh, subjects to be acted upon rather than, uh, you know, agents of their own destiny, uh, people with the ability to decide, make their own policies, evaluate the world, decide what their own interests are. Um, and because of that, a lot of Western policy towards China was premised on the notion that, you know, we will be acting upon them, they will not be acting upon us. Um, but there is actually quite a long history of the, um, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, of um, a fairly keen appreciation for how to um, manage the perceptions of foreigners with relations to China. Like you can go all the way back to the first contacts between American diplomats and Mao Zedong in caves in Yan'an, sort of the, the fabled Yan'an base of of the, the Civil War, uh, where the communists kind of rode things out until um, Japan fell. Um, and even in, those, even in those caves, you see you know, Mao Zedong and his lieutenants basically selling American diplomats the idea of what they think China could become, um, telling America that, you know, Mao talking to the diplomats about his admiration of democracy and Abraham Lincoln and how, you know, we really see, could see ourselves becoming something like that. Um, and in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, that's, I think, evolved into a very, very keen appreciation of who are the sectors of these societies with a lot of influence. And that translates into business and people with money. Um, and because of that, there are extremely concerted efforts to build ties with those communities, reach out to those communities, and to attempt very much to keep those communities on side. Um, and you see this very much now in the new Biden administration with attempts by the uh, PRC embassy in Washington, D.C. to reach out to U.S. business groups, um, and actually reciprocal efforts by, for example, some folks on Wall Street to build relationships with the PRC side to, I 
think the phrase they used was to get the relationship back on track. Um, and so it's, it's not really an accident. This is, there's agency, there's intelligence, there's decision making, there's an appreciation of how the world works on the PRC side of things that's actually quite sophisticated in some cases and leads to very intentional decisions in policy making choices. So I, that ended up being longer than I wanted. Let's go back to talking about infrastructure, sorry. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, still on the same topic. It's, um Considering that there are these needs and the choices need to be made, the question really fundamentally is, uh, can these risks that we've just talked about these be mitigated, or is the spectrum of, of influence so broad that it, it, we will simply accept being being influenced in some way? Uh, can, and in which case, how can democratic institutions or, or political processes been, be inoculated and still be able to reap the benefits of, of perhaps another funder for the region? Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can say a little bit because I think um, Matt Matt to my left already got us um, started on the topic. Left pad right <laughs> and right Matt um, got us started on the topic, and Not that is politically, of course. Yeah, I would never make any any such uh, judgments. Um, so so basically, the the idea that um, China, unlike you know, there was this triumphalism in the West, but China was actually paying a lot of attention to that. Um, and you know was was making its own plans that were largely ignored and and part of part of what these plans are of course you don't just stand up as the Chinese government and you know spread your own messages you don't just use your own media to spread you know positive messages about the Belt and Road Initiative you know for the whole psychological effect that this is a great thing or this is the thing and everybody needs to jump on the bandwagon. I think if you know if you just have a Chinese spokesperson system, if you had Zhao Lijian and, and Hua Chunying sitting there and saying that, or standing there and saying that, or if you had party state media like CGTN and Xinhua saying that, that wouldn't be super effective. So what you get, of course, is very, very broad networking um, that I, I, I think is a very under, still, I mean, people are becoming more aware of it, but it's still very much underappreciated how broad these ties are. You know, you have, aside from the state diplomacy, you have a very established party-to-party -party diplomacy system. I don't think any other country has it quite as extensive as China. I'm happy to be corrected, but it's like China is very much on top of its game where party-to-party -party diplomacy is concerned, which of course gives you the great benefit that whenever a new government comes into power in a democratic country, you already know them because you have been working with them in the past years. It also means that throughout, you know, throughout one party being in power, you can continue to work with the opposition to do certain things. What you can also do um, is, you know, identify up and coming politicians that you can try to win over by inviting them to trips to China. You have a huge pool of former politicians. I don't know if you've, you know, if you, once you take a look at what some former heads of state do, I think it's become fairly obvious that a lot of them now have very lucrative jobs involving a lot of money, lucrative positions from China and doing China's bidding. So you have those networks, you have local ties, where oftentimes, um, I, I, I think at the national level, a lot of governments are actually quite aware of what is happening and about the potential for economic coercion or other types of coercion, and they're trying to kind of get control of that. But at the local level, certain concerns play le a lot less into it. Like as a local government, I don't really care about national security. And yeah, I may have this harbor where the federal government stations its marine in my territory, but it's still mine and I get to sell it to a Chinese investor and don't necessarily have to consult with the national government before I do that. Um, so, so these broad ties through party-to-party -party diplomacy, friendship groups, um, local diplomacy really gives the Chinese government a huge network of people to work with. And that doesn't mean that every single person, whoever, you know, meets with the CCP or goes to China or attends one of those events is of course then bought and their soul is, uh, is lost to China. But I mean, if, if you know, if you ask, if you, if you make contacts with 10 people, um, and one out of 10 is, you know, then sees a mutual win-win situation where, you know, if you can work and promote the Chinese government's interests and they, they have their own interests promoted, that's enough. You don't need 10 out of 10. If you have one or two out of 10, that's already great. Um, 
so, so this broadly spread out networking, and then of course these people, oftentimes quite individual, quite influential political or business elites, speaking up on behalf of Chinese initiatives, creating that impression that. Um, in German, we say Alternativlosigkeit. How do you say that? There is lack of alternative. There is no other alternative. We need to get on board with this initiative or we're going to be left behind, so to create the psychological pressure. A lot of that is actually done via third parties who act out of various, you know, out, out of some, some of them might genuinely believe what they're saying. Some of them might cynically, you know, say, you know, I, I benefit from, from, from saying these things. Broad variety of, of motivations there. But that is actually what really also helps spread the message, and that is also what makes it a lot more complicated to address than simply saying, well, national governments need to gain a better understanding of this. Yes, but there is more than just national governments that need to understand the ramifications of this, and that's where the challenge um, begins. I think um, that was a really interesting Point to kind of segue to something that reflects uh, very much in uh, my data set on the digital Silk Road, which is that even in countries where national level and central governments have uh, attempted to um, uh, restrict the integration of Chinese technology into national uh, infrastructure networks, um, uh, and also to restrict just um, sensitive Chinese technologies in general, uh, we still see at the provincial and uh, also the industry and academic levels that these central um, central narratives and also central government policies don't always trickle down. And so you can have a situation where a country uh, such as India has, um, has opted um, uh, not to go for Chinese uh, 5G technology, but still uh, within industry, uh, so think of um, uh, important uh, uh, factories or industrial parks, or for example, in the academic sector at university campuses, there are still localized 5G networks that do leverage Huawei. And if those are then interconnected with a, with a further national infrastructure, then there's obviously contention there between reality and, uh, and, and central government policy. So I think that definitely is, is a concern. And for that, I think um, having uh, uh, data to actually reflect this is important, uh, have to also then increase awareness, not just within central governments, but across the board uh, within society, uh, industry, uh, and academia. Um, but also, of course, then to have a more holistic approach to the digital Silk Road. Is it important that we only focus on 5G? Or is it, for example, also important that whilst the UK has overturned its 5G uh, policy and strategy, that uh, there are still uh, local level governments that use uh, HIC vision surveillance uh, systems and cameras for their own safe and smart city projects. So I think these are really disconnected discussions that are happening at the moment, uh, whereby the risks, uh, I think, are being melded and identifying the risks specifically and then responding to those uh, might also be a, a, an important way forward. If I, if I could just ask what this means for, for policymakers and for, for decision makers when they're thinking about these bigger bigger uh, infrastructure needs, uh, if, if Radek or, or Brad, if you would like to. Uh, I try to be uh, to be uh, short. Uh, well, uh, I think the identif identifying of uh, those challenges or threats or, or whatever we're gonna uh, name them and uh, creating. Awareness is uh, extremely important, especially in uh, in uh, democratic uh, countries, because uh, whether this, uh, whether we are talking about infra big infrastructural projects or uh, smaller things, uh, I think there is. Someone mentioned that there is a, a sort of a sense of inevitability that. Uh, we have no other choice that we have to accept or we will be left uh, alone or uh, if we if we act independently uh, indep independently the the china's rage will be uh, so uh, so so great and so damaging to our economies that we we shouldn't even be thinking about that so uh, 
having an open mind and seeing uh, alternatives uh, is uh, extremely important. But the, the, the second thing I, I mentioned before is the awareness on every level, starting from uh, from central government and policymakers uh, till uh, till the very uh, very citizens of our of our countries, because. Uh, it's uh, absolutely obvious that we won't uh, convince overnight millions of people that they shouldn't be uh, using uh, AliExpress as uh, the platform for buying things in internet because uh, it's uh, because it's Chinese. But uh, if we can raise awareness about the threads that are connected with it, or with a nice app that uh, scans your face uh, in order to show you how you're gonna look like in 30 years but in the same time that your face is being and your, your biometrics are being stored on uh, chinese uh, servers uh, so you should maybe you should try and avoid uh, using this app this will in in the long run i think uh, this may prove extremely uh, effective and just last question for you, uh, uh, Matt, uh, is, is Three C's initiative that alternative, is it a sufficient alternative, do you think? I think it's necessary, but not sufficient. It's a, it's a, but it does, it does raise a sort of question, getting back to your question about the policymakers. I mean, I think policymakers need to think, I mean, like a, sort of ordinarily policymakers don't necessarily think about infrastructure. You know, infrastructure is something that economists and bankers and whatever think about, <laughs> or maybe politicians too, but I mean, like policymakers don't always think about infrastructure. They, they you know, big, you know, they think about, you know, whatever, you know, war peace. I mean, I, 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 I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it, they tend not to think about infrastructure as much because it's just, you know, it's just, the, you know, it's, it's, it's for the economists, it's for the b bankers and this sort of thing. I think poli policymakers need to think about things like infrastructure too, because it, it does actually really matter, as we've heard today. Uh, and I think these are, we've seen, uh, you know, sort of uh, play out before our eyes, number one. Number two, um, I think yeah, we really need to think about, um, this is a really long slog, this whole, whole question of how do you insulate or, or, or make our societies more resilient against the, the, um, the, the sort of the temptations or the, the inroads that these dictatorships make, in, or particularly since we're talking about China, this dictatorship talk is, is making in, inroads into our society and, and, and changing our, how, how, we, how we behave. And, 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 um, and, and we, this is something that needs to begin um, at a much early level, uh, at earlier level in terms in, in the schools and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in just because of, of you know the, the, the dangers that, that, that people might get into, uh, the, the exposure they may have to uh, or should we just simply the, the, the dependency or the, 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 the relationship they will be creating with the, with, with the Chinese uh, state um, uh, over, over, over the course of life, uh, a lifetime. And, he, and it, it's, a, it's a really long, uh, long debate. It's, it's going to be something that we're going to have to do for, 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 for decades, I think, in the near future, uh, because uh, it just sort of um, at, at all levels of society, uh, the conversation is really, really important, which is why you know this what you're doing here and the, the whole kind of all the efforts that are being made out elsewhere the researchers that you guys are all the research that you all are doing on, on this and, and, and disseminating it and and trying to um, to 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 uh, educate people more as to, as to what the challenge really is is extremely important and um, and even if it's going to and unfortunately it's going to be a, a, you know you'll be in, 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 in <laughs> you'll have, have a job for the rest of your life I think because of the, you know, the, of the challenge that this this poses uh, over uh, over our lifetimes um, so um, uh, so anyway it, it's just uh, it, it's something that 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 um, that, that you know that you know necessary but not it's not, not sufficient for the for, for the narrower issue of three C's but also but also uh, a, a much broader um, open you know sort of uh, issue that, that needs to be uh, dealt with at, 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 at you know at so many different levels uh, over such a long time um, because of the, the magnitude of, of what, I think what we're up against. Uh, with that, I'd, li I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, we have reached our we have reached our time limit, but thank you everyone for your contributions today. It was really a pleasure for me to talk to you all, and, and uh, I hope it was for everyone else here. Thank, thank you. Very much.